But uh, first, I just wanted to introduce uh, Dr. Gear. Um, he's an information security uh, visionary. I don't think I need to talk a lot about him, but he's currently the Chief Information Security Officer of InQtel. And um, without further ado, I wanted to introduce uh, Dr. Gear. Nice round of applause for Dr. Gear. take these kind of things uh, somewhat seriously so um, but that also means I appreciate uh, interruptions and uh, questions and so forth feel free to do so um, if I don't see you uh, be more obvious with your arms or something I, I want to say a little something about Incontel just because this is a chance to do it although this is not an Incontel talk to be clear um, if you're not familiar with it um, Incontel is a uh, freestanding uh, investment firm we are funded by, honestly, your tax dollars. Uh, if you are a taxpayer, let's assume most of you are, um, you should be grateful for uh, the efficiency with which uh, we spend your money. We are uh, small by Washington standards. Um, I've learned a term of art in Washington, and that is that we are budget lint. Uh, so, uh, uh, you can be thankful for that, I guess, as well. Uh, if you are an entrepreneur or plan to be, um, you should keep us in mind. When I say we're an investment firm, we're a little different than others insofar as we are a creature of the intelligence community. Um, our funding comes by way of the intelligence community, broadly speaking. Um, I don't mean just CIA, I mean all of them. National Security, <coughs> National Reconnaissance, uh, National Security, all of them. Uh, that includes things like TSA and FBI as well. Um, the monies that we have and invest, and this is where if you're an entrepreneur or a plan to be, you should keep this in mind, are done because what we want is companies that will produce something that will be of interest to the intelligence community. And as such, we are not in the business of making money. If you're a venture capitalist, you're sitting behind your desk, there's a line of people out the door holding their hat. And um, your question for all of them is, if I give you a dollar, will I get 10 back? Um, in our case, we find 60% of the companies we invest in 70% of those have never done business with any government, and uh, we are partly the way in which uh, small companies grow, and we're partly the way in which they get um, a customer base that's in the uh, government sector. If you've ever, again, if you've ever tried to be an entrepreneur, you will know that uh, by and large, it's a bad bargain to decide to uh, try to get into the federal market soon because it's uh, troublesome. We've invested in a lot of companies that you might be familiar with. Hands down, the most famous was uh, one called Keyhole, which you would now know as Google Earth, uh, was ours, for example. Mostly what we do is we pay people to add features or change the way their product works slightly so that it is of interest uh, to the intelligence community. With Keyhole, it was adding the API that allows you to combine uh, maps and data of your own, uh, rather than just having it, which is the original plan, be an automobile navigation tool. Um, other companies though, that are more relevant to you here, I don't know that I can necessarily get all of them, but I'll rattle off a few. ArcSight, FireEye, Palantir, uh, Huddle, Makana, Paracode, uh, Reversing Labs. Um, I'm probably forgetting somebody, not intentionally, but those are companies that we have invested in that, again, with which you might be familiar. In all cases, what we offer them is a chance to do something that may well, in fact, be in their in their roadmap, uh, but would be delayed, or which was not something that they had uh, planned uh, to do. A long time ago, uh, I took one of my daughters to the Academy Awards, and we managed to, I won't quite say break in, but end up in the front row. And um, um, that's an interesting story we can do off camera. But uh, I, will, I watched the people who are miking up folks, and um, it's quite remarkable, Partic no offense to women, but particularly when there was no place to hang the mic. It's, uh, an interesting problem if you're in that line of work. Um, but back to Incutel, we, we, we invest in a lot of them, and most of those are where, again, we are taking something out of their roadmap or an adaptation of what they do that would be of interest to the intelligence community. Uh, we do not, if you're, again, if you're an entrepreneur, we do not take board seats, we do not take equity. Um, so we are non-dilutive to founders, which is very useful. And everything we do is covered with a statement of work that has warrant backing, which is to say options backing, 
If, in fact, you have a wonderful day and you go public or you sell to somebody with a lot of cash or whatever, yes, of course, we exercise our options and the money goes back in the pool, back to being good for you as a taxpayer. Um, if not, that's not the point. The point is that uh, whereas a venture guy would say, if I give you a dollar, will we get 10? Ours is, if we give you a dollar, will you live long enough to build the stuff that we're looking for? Um, and so I just leave it at that. Um, we have an office in Waltham for what it is worth. <coughs> Uh, headquarters is needless to say in Washington and the other off-board office will not surprise you. It's on Sand Hill Road in Menlo Park. Um, all, lo all of those are locations that might be unsurprising. So I'll, I'll skip the Incutel part from that point forward. This is not an Incutel talk. Um, what this is is a talk on identity and privacy and to a degree identity um, as privacy. I say that not because I have a thoroughgoing last word analysis, but because I think the rate of change that we are in, the rate of change that we see, is such that the issues in front of us are ones which, to a small degree, we can see where they lead, but not entirely. Everybody here knows that the rate of change, generally speaking, is very fast, and that the rate of change is something that is not anticipatable well enough to show up in policy, policy in the Washington or broader <coughs> sense, uh, before the, the technology is already in place. We've had that kind of experience before. Uh, the first automobile license plates um, did not occur until there had been a number of traffic accidents. Um, oddly enough, the first one of which was the only two cars in Ohio hit each other at an intersection. Um, nevertheless, the idea that there is a rate of change at which um, anticipatory uh, rulemaking is impossible or implausible, that's probably good, but nevertheless, it's a fact. Or put it slightly differently, no society, no people, no entity, no government needs rules against things which are impossible. But as you well know, we are converting things that are impossible into things that are possible at a fairly fast clip. Um, examples of that, what would be a good example? Uh, SB 1386, the California Data Breach Law, which is the first of its kind. How did you get that? The answer is two parts. One, the California personnel system managed to dump the personal information of the entire employee base of the state of California on the internet. That happened to include the legislature. Uh, a law ensued. This should come as no surprise. Uh, the law, by the way, was written by Deirdre Mulligan, then of CDT, now um, elsewhere. And what she did was she took a toxic waste spill law and substituted a few nouns where it had been what happens if you pour trichloroethylene on the street and now it is what happens if you pour information uh, onto the um, digital superhighway. And that is actually how it was written. There are now a lot of them. They don't quite match to each other. And if you're a large firm, of course, you probably are well aware that on a global scale, uh, the Venn diagram intersection of all the rules that you have to follow is the null set. That, of course, is another problem um, altogether. But this idea that as things develop, we need to anticipate or react is quite strong. I, by the way, do not have a clearance. I work without a clearance as a matter of choice. I work with a lot of people who are cleared. It does get in the way from time to time. But it is my version of putting my money where my mouth is when it comes to uh, what I know to call open source intelligence. And I'm a great believer in that. I think that um, I don't need, by and large, the clearance except for one thing, and that is maybe to see the future a little earlier than others. But if the rate at which the future arrives continues to accelerate, the value of the clearance declines because the future occurs quick enough that a long view of it doesn't help. Uh, those of you who've read um, True Names by Werner Wenge may recall uh, that story. And it was written quite a long time ago which he said something quite fascinating. He said, when I began writing science fiction, the stuff that I was talking about would take 10 to 20 years to reach the public consciousness. Now I have a hard time staying 18 months out. And for someone of his caliber to say that, I think again illustrates that the rate of change is not just technologic development as I suspect all of you are deeply involved with, but it is the broader implications as well. And in fact, I'm reasonably certain that all of you, all of us, everybody in this field, needs to be thinking at least some of the time about policy questions and not just about technology. I, like you, prefer to work on things and just make them operate. 
I, I'm old enough to remember the original uh, you know, RFC number one from the IETF and Dane Clark's uh, announcement about that, which is we don't believe in King's president or voting. What we believe in is, is uh, rough consensus and working code. I'm in that school. At the same time, it's not as if what we are doing doesn't have broad effects. And I think all of you would be advised to at least pay attention, if not involve yourself, in how legislatures and the like uh, work on that. There are currently roughly 25 bills in the Congress about cybersecurity alone, many of which you would not like, if, and I'll leave it to you to read them, but many of which you would not like. At the same time, those are folks who are doing their best, and what does that mean? And it means that doing their best in this, in this space is difficult, particularly when what you're talking about on the one hand is a rate of technology change that is minimal and small and quick versus a rate at which one can plausibly provide rules to society at large, which is anything but. And again, it's probably a good thing that the rate at which you can apply rules to the rest of society is slow, uh, contemplative, uh, full of compromise, etc. That's all in all probably good because the alternative would not be good. The alternative is um, authoritarian. Nevertheless, I, I suggest that all of you should, uh, in some sense, pay attention to that. Um, when I think looking back, you could say, where did we all come from? I know everyone my age in security was trained for something else. Um, I was trained for what it's worth as a biostatistician. Um, I actually have a computer science degree, but, but the main training was as a biostatistician. That means to a degree, I think like a biostatistician. That is to say, I view many things as questions of like public health or disease, disease models or transmission or, or those kinds of things. That's fine. That's a, that's a good prep. Um, it's just as good a prep to be a civil engineer. Why do buildings fall down? How did the uh, uh, Tacoma Narrows Bridge uh, uh, oscillate itself into non-existence? Uh, um, and so forth. How, how, how do you build things that survive situations outside of the envelope that was their set of design requirements. That's a, that's a fine preparation. Being a lawyer is a fine preparation because lawyers, amongst other things, have to worry about the difference between rule of the procedure of it and enforceability. How do, you, how do you think about things which you would like to have happen, but is it plausible to enforce them? As you all know, the number of rules is very large now. Uh, I recommend a book, um, the title of which is Three Felonies a Day, uh, written by uh, Harvey Silverglate um, at the Harvard Law School, in which he talks about the number of rules are such now that nearly everyone is committing, as he puts it, felonies a day, just because, frankly, you don't know what all of the felonies you might be committing are. Um, that being said, we risk, of course, getting ourselves into a situation where almost all enforcement is selective. And selective enforcement, again, is not the hallmark of a free society, it's the hallmark of a non-free um, society. So these are important questions. I'm going to speak in a sense about one of them, but more as a matter of trying to think about where things lead and, ra and not as something where I'm trying to say we should do this or we should do that or we should not do something else. The title of this was Identity is Privacy. And identity is a hot topic. If you haven't seen it, uh, you might want to read the so-called National Strategy for Trusted Identities in Cyberspace, or NSTIC. Uh, if you hang around Washington, uh, everything is an acronym, so NSTIC is the way it is said, uh, but the National Strategy for Trusted Identities in Cyberspace. It was uh, put out by the Obama administration, I think, a little over a year ago. I'm sorry, I can't remember the exact date. But nevertheless, um, it's an idea of what do you do about the problem of identity. Now, mind you, many of the people who are talking about identity are, frankly, more interested in attribution. Um, attribution being a term of art of if someone, if a bullet comes by your head, who sent it? And that idea of attribution as applied to the digital sphere does bring up the question of uh, anonymity as, from their point of view, a problem. You may view anonymity as far from a problem, but rather as something that is the hallmark of either living in a big city or being on the internet at large. It is now, of course, entirely passe, but John Perry Barlow's uh, Declaration of Independence for Cyberspace, uh, when reread now, uh, can only be described as wishful thinking, um, yet attractive wishful thinking. I, I still think it was attractive wishful thinking, but that's what it has turned out to be. Aspects of that include the so-called end-to-end principle. The end-to-end -end principle, which was uh, first put out by, I believe, uh, Clark, uh, Salzer, 
and read, if I remember correctly. Um, and it said that the internet, and I believe that to be in many ways the fundamental design decision in the internet as we have it now. For those of you old enough to remember, the telephone system had anything but those characteristics. Rather, it had the idea that it was a network in some sense that was responsible for everything. Whereas the internet design principles that came from the end-to-end -end idea um, were quite the opposite. And end-to-end -end says that what the network is is a transport mechanism. It is not a policy enforcement tool. And as a transport mechanism, it carried all packets. And the question was, what security regime did that require? And the answer is none, because that was a subject of discussion and negotiation between the endpoints. Endpoints itself, at the time, was well understood. It is now difficult. It is now difficult to understand what endpoint means. Is the endpoint code? Is the endpoint you? Is the endpoint a device? I suspect everybody in this room has multiple devices, some of which are probably synced with each other. What is your endpoint? Um, Marjorie Blumenthal and Dave Clark have written a, another paper trying to bring that up to date. Uh, again, I'll leave that to you to read. But nevertheless, it is a thing where the definitions have changed. Again, with my time in Washington, I can say that in any public policy, the real part you should read is the definitions page. It's all over after that. The definitions page is where it matters. The rest of it is it's all over. Because the definitions page says what we mean by X or what we mean by Y, and the rest of it is the implementation details. So as you, if you don't have the heart to read 25 bills a season or what have you, um, at least take a look at the definitions page because those have a lot of impact on what then, then happens. Um, if you're familiar with the European Data Privacy Protection uh, Initiative, for example, you will know that uh, in Europe there's a considerable debate about, quote, the right to be forgotten. And the right to be forgotten says that I'd like data about me to go away. This, of course, is quite difficult. It's quite difficult in any number of ways, not the least of which will be experienced by most people, including my children, who are uh, coming of age as we speak and who have been, uh, in so many words, disclosing rather a lot uh, between the time they got their first device and the time they entered the job market. That uh, is just one example, but it's one that everyone is familiar with. Nevertheless, uh, the right to be forgotten has its attractiveness. There are communities in England, small towns, that have asked to be taken off the map. And you might say, why would you ask to be taken off the map? And the answer is that um, Czechoslovakian uh, lorry drivers who don't speak English and read only GPS are driving big trucks through towns where the roads are all uh, single lane. And they would like to be taken off the map so that GPS can't find them so nobody routes their trucks through the assembled sheep on the roadway, et cetera. <coughs> These, these kinds of things are what I'm getting at, and there, there's a plethora of examples. There's more examples than we can probably enumerate. This, again, may be good and it may not be, but it indicates to me anyway that where technology takes us is not yet out of our control, but it could well be. I'm not altogether convinced about the pending um, singularity and the various writings that have been done about that, principally by Ray Kurzweil and, and co-authors. But I am nevertheless convinced that an environment in which the number of devices and the amount of knowledge and the amount of information dwarfs any one person's ability to, to either consume it or much less and uh, inventory it. How many places can you be found on the internet? If you want to watch something, watch this Sunday on 60 Minutes, where Leslie Stahl and Alessandro Acquisti who is a professor at Carnegie Mellon, will talk about, quote, re-identification, unquote. And re-identification is where you think you're anonymous, but you're not. The experiment that they perform, they've exform, performed many experiments. Acquisti, by the way, I believe is the best experimental designer in this field, uh, hands down. Nevertheless, uh, what they will show is they went out on the Carnegie Mellon campus, uh, took a bunch of pictures of people at random, and then were able to identify them uh, by <coughs> wandering around the internet. There are three billion new photos of, with people's faces in it uploaded a month. So even if you are not in the habit of uploading pictures of yourself in either dignified or undignified situations, the odds that someone else has done so are large. And re-identification um, is now a term of art that you might want to uh, scan. Um, there are lots of papers in this space. And it begins to look like re-identification is difficult. You, I'm sure, are well aware that 
there have been several episodes where, quote, anonymous data, unquote, has been shared with the research public. Uh, AOL, I think, did it first, but there have been a bunch of them, people that have done it. And the idea was, we'll provide some anonymous data so that researchers can look at, at you know, patterns of use and the like, but not actually identify people. Every one of those, to my knowledge, has come to grief in that um, if you are talking about something that not many people are talking about, if you are unique in any way, it, <coughs> odds are it can be found. And so this technologic change where so much of it is out there that you are unlikely to be able to corral it is probably the basis for the uh, European desire for a right to be forgotten. At the same time, I view that as almost impossible to enforce. Amongst other things, in a world of republication, where people scrape one website and put it on another, finding all the places to turn it off are difficult. It has, of course, at the corporate level, been some time since it was far cheaper to keep all your data than to do selective deletion. It is far more tractable, and it is far cheaper and more cost-effective just to keep all your data. And as we know, the amount of data is growing quite quickly. Uh, Gartner's estimate is world doubling time of data is under 30 months now and declining. If you look at the rate of Moore's law, which seems to be still holding up, that's a doubling every 18 months. But I will point out that the cost effectiveness uh, doubling time for storage is under 12 and for bandwidth at least, not necessarily what you can buy at home, but bandwidth in the laboratory, it's probably under nine. So you, at, let me just say as round numbers, 18, 12, and nine is um, two orders of magnitude in computing power a decade, but three in storage and four in bandwidth, which says that in future, data in general, data in general will be far more extensive than our computing can keep up with it, and at the same time, it will be far more mobile than we're used to having. So those things make a, a, a important change in the way we view the world. For those of you who are in the security trade, which I suspect is 99.44% of you, the I think we can owe our jobs to something that I will describe. <coughs> there was a, a professor at, at Harvard named Stephen Jay Gould. You may or may not have ever heard his name. He had, he's a paleobiologist. He had some very interesting uh, shows on um, national public uh, television. And he talked a lot about the course of evolution. But he, early in his career, coined a term which has stuck. And as you well know, if you're an academic and you coin a term that sticks, uh, you are not forgotten. <laughs> That's how it works. And his term of art was punctuated equilibrium. The idea that evolution as a process is, of course, undirected. It does not have an animate function per se. And furthermore, that it is not a steady upslope at 8% grade. It is instead long periods of quiet punctuated by rapid change, whether you're talking about the Precambrian explosion of species or what have you, that there are these long periods where nothing happens and followed by short periods in which everything happens. I would suggest that that occurs in security as well. And all of you can, in some sense, um, uh, thank Microsoft for your jobs in when they first introduced a TCP ISP stack for free in Windows, I believe Windows 3, um, what did that do? And, it's, and the answer is it did something really good but it had a side effect. And the side effect was it took an operating system that had been designed for a single owner operator on it, most a private network, and connected it to the universe. The problem, of course, is that in the universe, every sociopath is your next door neighbor. And this has had its effect. If you looked at the, I'm a, again, I'm a statistician, I'm a numbers guy, I'm the son of, a, of an accountant. Uh, I spent my youth checking adding machine tapes. It's numbers are sort of what I'm made of. If you looked at the rate at which attacks were reported to the CERT at CMU, they've since stopped doing that, which I'll come back to. But if you looked at the rate and you looked at, believe it or not, the second derivative, I assume everybody can speak enough calculus to know what that is, what you saw is a sharp spike <coughs> four and a half months after the introduction of TCP IP uh, as a free component of the Windows operating system. Now, why is that interesting? And the answer is it's interesting because it was a sharp spike, never to occur again, in the rate of attacks as reported to the CERT subsequent to the introduction of a TCP IP stack in Windows. A second derivative spike is like lighting the solid fuel on a shuttle. Nothing happens at first. You say, is that all there is? But the, there's two things about that. One, you can't turn it back off. 
And two, pretty soon you realize that that was important because the acceleration gets to be, you know, five Gs or something, and you are not just plastered to your seat, you can't raise a finger. It's that kind of phenomenon that I believe produced the need for people like us. That's one punctuated equilibrium. The, the second one was, I believe, about five years ago, and not nearly as sharp, but the punctuation was the, we had finally gotten to where we were good enough at what we do that finding vulnerabilities was no longer really a hobby. You had to do it as a job. You couldn't just do it as a hobby. You needed to be paid for it. You needed to have something that bought your time and allowed you to find vulnerabilities. Under the circumstance of it being a hobby, what do you get? And the answer is bragging rights. How do you get them? And the answer is you announce what you found. And you announce it quickly, lest, of course, someone else find it too. When you do that, when you announce them, it says that the public is, generally speaking, informed about where the vulnerabilities are at roughly the rate at which they are discovered. In a world in which people are paid to do this, they do not share. The side effect of that is the proportion of all vulnerabilities that are publicly known begins to fall. And I think the reason that you see so much now where people are saying, where are all these zero days coming from? And the answer is, the they're not coming as fast perhaps as they once did, but the proportion of them, the fact that they are zero day, the proportion of them that are known in advance falls because the people who are finding them are doing it as a job, not as a hobby, and they don't share. That was the second punctuated equilibrium, and I think it changed the way in which vulnerabilities and attacks based on them have proceeded. I'll come back to that as a policy matter in a second. But I think it changed things, and I think it changed things quite substantially, <coughs> although, again, it wasn't quite as sharp. We're in the knee of the curve right now for what I believe is um, a third one, and that is the rapid worldwide adoption of mobile technologies. And the reason for that, and, and its side effects, like bring your own device to work, for example, the side effects of that are that reachability and the kinds of activities that take place without going through a central anything um, are, are growing. And I believe they're going to change things a lot. One aspect of that, of course, is that the desktop computer as a consumer durable is now beginning to fade. Um, I believe it was September a year ago when, the to when you, if you look at the total chip, uh, CPU chip shipments from the fabricators, it no longer was PCs, it was mobile devices. And it's been a little over a year now that the dominant customer target for the chip makers is not the desktop machine. It's not the computer as we ordinarily think of it, it is other things. And I'm sure you know that if you buy a car these days, there's bunches of uh, various kinds of uh, CPUs in it, most of which are out of surveillance. Now, I say that for a point, and that is that if you are a human being sitting behind a machine, what are human beings good at? And the answer is, they're good at noticing patterns. That's what we're good at. That's, you know, why we are what we are. We can notice patterns, and because we have language, we can share them with other people. That is what separates us from, you know, most of the other uh, animate objects. <coughs> that being said, where does that lead us? And the answer is, if the majority of devices are now beginning to appear in, a lar in places where there's no person, in some sense, watching them, the pattern recognition that we are so good at is no longer a protection, it's an irrelevancy. And so one of the questions for you is how close are we to the point where we cannot expect people to be the protectors, we have to expect machines to be the protectors. And yeah, I guess I'm probably touching on the, on the script of the matrix here, but the idea that the machines are what protect us as opposed to ourselves is, I think, relevant, and I believe we are in the knee of the curve on that, particularly as, quote, the Internet of Things, unquote, begins to build. Those bring us a lot of changes, and I believe they're a punctuation, a punctuation point at which the basic dynamic of what's going on has now different drivers. The drivers modify because of this phenomenon that I just spoke of. Now, that is neither good nor bad. I'm not trying to imply that those things are, are good or bad. What I'm trying to say is that those kinds of events that change the, uh, the underlying paradigm of what, for example, does security mean, um, up to and including what does end-to-end -end mean, which I spoke of earlier. Those are the things which, in a sense, policy will eventually touch. No, as I said, no society needs rules against things which are impossible. As we make things that are possible faster, 
and as we do them in a ways where, in a sense, people are not the surveillance <coughs> mechanism for them, but are rather machines, if at all, that does change how things work. It does change a lot. My, um, I do deal with the defense uh, establishment on a fair basis. They have, to a degree, adopted a viewpoint, which I'm, I'm glad they have. Um, I'm by no means the author of it, but one of the various rabble-rousers about this, which is that intrusion prevention is probably a lost cause. Intrusion tolerance is probably the better design principle. The idea that you cannot prevent people from getting in, but what you can do, quite possibly, is prevent them from doing uh, anything that derails the fundamental mission of the uh, computer in, in general. Our opponents do the same thing. You, I'm sure, have seen the um, isn't there a botnet that's mining bitcoins right now and using your spare cycles for this purpose? Um, in a sense, what do you care? Now, we can debate that if you like, but what do you care? You still have all the compute power you need because it's nice about not stealing it when you need it. On the other hand, there's an awful lot of compute <coughs> power out there that could be harnessed for things of that sort. Do you care? Do you? And it's a real question, do you care? Do you care if machinery that you own is being used for something that you didn't ask it to do? I read uh, some, there's, there's an ongoing discussion on one of the cryptography lists. It's a, a cryptography list about um, um, the application of cryptography. And they have been talking over the last few days about whether or not it is, at this point, uh, possible to say that I'm going to verify the code I use. And someone made the very <coughs> cogent remark that in a single day, uh, he now uses more code than he could probably himself review in a lifetime. So his only alternative is to pay people to review it. The problem with that, of course, is the people he's paying to review it could probably get a better price from people that are not your friends. And so where do we want to go with that? Let me offer a policy kind of question. And this is one where I am not a lobbyist with a capital L in registration and all that, but a lobbyist in this sense. And that is, I think the U.S. government ought to corner the market in vulnerabilities. <coughs> As you well know, there's a, vulnerability, there's a vulnerability market out there. There are people who buy them and, they, and the people who sell them. Two brothers from Texas, the Hunt brothers, were able to corner the world silver market. You think the U.S. government doesn't have enough money to corner the world vulnerability market. We just simply announced, show us a competing offer, we'll pay you 10x. Now, of course there are folks who say, I do not sell to Americans, I only sell to Ukrainians. Those folks won't sell. But if you know that there is a market, and if you know that a fair number of the vulnerabilities that are found are at least <coughs> automationisted, if not automation then in turn, someone who has them and says, I do not sell to Americans, will know that someone else will discover it in due course, and so the shelf life of the thing that they have found is limited, and they must find somebody to sell it to. I think we would collapse the market fairly quickly, but I say that on one condition, and I mean this, that if we're going to buy those, we're going to make them public. I do not want them <coughs> stored up as a kind of alternative to nuclear weapons in silos. I want them made public. And for what it's worth, General Hayden feels the same way. Uh, God be praised. Um, he feels the same way about that, with, that the idea of classifying vulnerabilities is nonsense. Because amongst other things, it means everyone else will follow suit. And pretty soon, and, and as you know, nearly every country that's worth talking about has some study group out there trying to find every way it can modify the internet experience or perhaps derail the internet experience of potential adversaries that it might find in a shooting war. If we were to make them all public, we empty their warehouse of zero days at the same time we empty ours. And so the idea of somehow or other we need to buy them all and in turn give them <coughs> to your favorite covert agency is, I believe, insane. And it is cheap to buy them all on the scale at which uh, the U.S. federal budget um, is denominated. We need to do that. And the reason we need to do that is I think the response to one, uh, to one or perhaps two of those equilibrium punctuators of which I just spoke. Now, that's only one example, but it's the kind of example of where does this lead and what could we do that I think people such as yourselves who are in a better position to know what side effects are <coughs> need to be uh, outspoken. You may or may not recall that there are numbers of policies uh, against modifying other people's computers, the Computer Fraud and Abuse Act, uh, which of course is problematic at many levels, not just Aaron Swartz, but problematic at in many levels. 
because amongst other things, what is happening amongst laws and regulations we see is we have begun to separate, to no longer require actus reus and mens rea, which is to say we have begun to say in the traditional criminal law setting, it said that you had to have done something and you had to have done it with intent. Many of the computer security laws, either on the books or being proposed, don't ask the question of what was your intent. They ask only the question of what did you do, which I think feeds Harvey, it, it, it appears in Harvey Silvergate's book as well. It feeds this idea that if you do something, it doesn't matter whether you meant to. If it can be interpreted as wrong, it's a crime per se. That is a problem. And one of those in particular is what to do about shooting back. There are a lot of people who want to shoot back. I'm one of them. I admit right off the bat that I want to shoot back. And yes, it has unknowable collateral damage. And I say that not because I like that fact, but because it is a fact. And if I have to talk about what the trade-offs are, I think I'm going to come down on the side of you should be allowed to shoot back. Stuart Baker, who was the general counsel uh, for the NSA for a while and has been is quite well known and a big name in Washington and so forth. You can look up his testimony from last September to the Department of Homeland Security in which he talked about that. His analogy, and remember, law, the practice of law is the search for analogies. That's what it is. His analogy was the, the, the early West in this country where if for whatever reason there was no law in this territory, you could hire Pinkertons to chase down the guys who stole the gold out of your stagecoach. The idea that there are private police forces to make up for the absence of uh, public law that is effective is something that he was talking about. I strongly recommend reading his testimony. Again, it was from September uh, Stuart Baker. It, it, though, nevertheless raises this question of what should we be doing given that our opponents are now people who are not slouches. They are very, very good. There are on this past Tuesday, was there not one of the, one of the uh, advisories was, if I remember correctly, HTTP sys, where you can send a single packet to an IIS server and you can't recover the IIS server without rebooting the machine. Now there's an interesting little tool. What would you do with that? The answer is, well, if I was the person who found it, I would sell it to Anonymous. Of course, strictly speaking, I would not, but you get the idea. Uh, I would sell it to Anonymous. I don't actually sell anything. Um, I'm past the point where I'm a fighter pilot. I'm now more like an air show judge. Um, um, but nevertheless, what would you do with that? And I think denial of service, particularly denial of service as a purchased good, you know, you can buy denial of service now relatively cheaply. I got an advertisement last night, not for denial of service, but for Twitter followers. If you buy enough of them, they're one-tenth of a cent apiece. You can buy a couple hundred thousand for a couple, of a couple hundred dollars. Now, what does that mean? And it means that our opponents know what they're doing. And part of that, of course, is the design characteristics of the Internet. The design characteristics of the Internet were for survivability, not for policy. And I still believe that the end-to-end -end principle is the most important decision we ever made. Nevertheless, one might say, so what, does that, what would that do for policy? What would our friends in Washington want to do with that? Well, I'll tell you what they want to do, and it's obvious the last 10 years and newspaper headlines would tell you, and that is they want to deputize all the ISPs. And in fact, in a country, this one, where 90% of the internet, however you want to describe it, and I don't mean just ISPs, I mean every internet facing service, et cetera, if 90% of it is, or 95% <coughs> of it, is owned by the private sector, what do you do? And the answer is either you nationalize it or you deputize people against their will. If I were in charge, which I'm not, or if I, can, if I can channel for Dr. Seuss, if I ran the zoo, I think I would say to the ISPs, here's your choice. Either you're a common carrier, in which case we give you the liability protection that common carriers get. You're not, FedEx is not responsible for transporting a package that is illegal. If you're a common carrier, you carry all bits equivalently. You do not charge differentially. If you want to charge differentially, you're welcome to do that, but by the way, you're responsible for content. Choose wisely, we don't give refunds. That's, that's what I would say if I ran the zoo. Maybe it's good that I don't run the zoo, but nevertheless, that's an example where what is going on is the ISPs are being deputized against their will across the board. 
There's an ongoing discussion about whether or not Skype has a back door. Why would it have a back door? And the answer is not in your interest. If it has a back door, given who owns it now, it would be because the back door was required to operate in probably other countries. If you are a multinational, you have to abide by the laws of the countries you're in, and not everybody is freedom-loving as much as we are <coughs> here. I'll also point out, of course, that in a free country, if something isn't explicitly forbidden, you're free to do it. In a non-free country, if something isn't explicitly permitted, you're forbidden. And we are seeing that in a large number of spaces now. Um, look across, um, what's an example? Look at Saudi Arabia's rules about the internet as an example. How do you deal with that if you're a large company? And the answer is you, in fact, have multiple versions that abide by local rules. Of course, locality is another matter. Geocoding the internet has its advantages. It also has its disadvantages. Um, you can figure that out. You, you know what I'm talking about. It has its advantages and its disadvantages. What is the trade-off there? The trade-off depends on where you think the future is. If you think the future is one kind of future, then the trade-offs of geolocating the internet are bad. If you think of a different kind of future, the advantages <coughs> of geocoding the internet are good. It will happen if you don't say something. And it will happen in a way that, amongst other things, will quite likely play out first in an internet sales tax, if indeed the government passes that. If it passes an internet sales tax, the question is, who gets deputized besides FedEx and, and the Postal Service and UPS? I'm not sure, but it probably means looking for where is the actual source address physically. You know, is it at my address, which is in Rhode Island? Is it at your address? Some of you no doubt live in this town. Uh, where is it? And does that matter to you that that is a recorded matter? Does it matter to you that, as I said earlier, recording everything is cheaper than recording just some things based on a decision? Because the, the time required to make a decision <coughs> is very, very small. There's a company in Washington uh, run by uh, Meet Yorin uh, called NetWitness. What does it do? And the answer is it records all the data coming into a company. It records everything. Um, this has value if you later discover that a problem is because you can work backwards and say, where did this first appear? How long has this been going on? Because that, that question, if you're in the intelligence world, how long has this been going on is far more interesting than who is doing this. How long has this been going on? Because to do any kind of repair, you have to know how far has it been. The, the theft of the avionics in the F-35 Joint Strike Fighter is an example of that. Had to be redesigned. How did, it, how did the theft happen? The answer is counterparties. If you look at the Verizon data breach report, what does it say? It says that 80% of all data thefts are discovered not by the victim, but by somebody else. Myself and a colleague in, in New York who works at a bank that doesn't really allow me to say who he is, run something called the Index of Cybersecurity. I invite anybody here to be in contact about that because we're always looking for respondents. Respondents in this case means we ask people their opinion. Just like if you're familiar with the Consumer Confidence Index. That is an opinion-based index done by asking people questions on a monthly basis. In the case of that one, for what it's worth, the conference board pays the Nielsen organization to make 5,000 random phone calls a month. As you might guess, I'm not in the business of making 5,000 random phone calls a month. Instead, what this is, is a little one-page click button, a set of click buttons that, um, thank you, a little one-page set of click buttons that asks, in the last month, has, for example, malware pressure on your environment gotten worse, gotten better, gotten a lot worse, gotten a lot better, <coughs> stayed the same? For those of you who've done survey research, that's called a Likert scale. It's typical in survey research. It has one useful feature. I'm sure if I asked everybody in this room to write on a piece of paper what their definition of a vulnerability is, we would have more than one answer. We'd probably have many answers. We'd probably have something like 50% of the count in the room different answers. That is a problem if what you're trying to do is science. If you're trying to do science and say, I'm looking for the causal sources of effects that I can see, having de definition problems is an issue. If, on the other hand, you say to people, Paul, in the last month, has vulnerability pressure gotten better or gotten worse? What is important there is, I'm picking on somebody, I know. Uh, what's, got, what's important about that is, I don't care what his definition is. All I care is that it's self-stable. Self 
If his definition is out of the blue every month, a different one, I'm in trouble. But let's assume for the moment that it's the same every month. And so what I'm asking is the differential. Speaking as a statistician, if whatever you're measuring, your measuring device is relatively poor, as long as the errors it carries are not themselves pathologic, I'll leave that as a sidebar discussion, as long as the errors it's carrying are not pathologic, then the trend line that results from asking better or worse is okay, and I can obviate the problem of people's definitions are not all the same. So we ask these of a lot of people. The people we're looking for, by the way, are people who have operational responsibility for cybersecurity, and as such are on the front lines. They know what the current situation is. I'm not looking for academics, I'm not looking for marketing people, I'm not looking for CEOs, I'm looking for people, maybe CISO, maybe not, maybe a level <coughs> below CISO. I'm looking for people who have an opinion, and the opinion is based on current operational reality. Now, that opinion is not from their firm. It is from the individual. I'm, I don't care if I have five people from, I'm gonna pick something out of the blue, this is not the case. I don't care if I have five people from Morgan Stanley, what I care about is they're all experts. Because what I'm looking for is expert opinion, and what I'm trying to get at is, is the cybersecurity situation getting better or getting worse? And we ask 24 questions, and we compound those together, and we do it just like you would do a financial index. In fact, the math is exactly the same. And the reason for that is so no one can complain that our results are an artifact of our methods. We're entirely boring. And in fact, some people say, well, this is boring, why are you doing this? And the answer is, boring is good. Now, in doing this, we also every month, by the way, the trend is inexorably upward. This should come as no surprise. Uh, upward in a sense of risk is rising. Uh, our index is like golf. A higher score is not what you want. Um, the, it's, it's inexorably rising. However, on a month-to-month -month basis, which components of the overall risk have risen the most varies all over the map. It just simply is all over the map. One month, it's nation state. One month, it is insider. One month it is automated malware. You get the idea. So the, if you do rank statistics or you, you rank order, what was the biggest contribution to the overall change in the index of cybersecurity each month, what's on top is a total rat's nest. If you plot it out, it's just a total rat's nest, which I think is good, by the way. It says that the components we're asking have high volatility, even if the compounding of them does not have high volatility. Uh, volatility is a variance, if you prefer. Um, I'm sorry, I worked in finance for a long time, so volatility is the word that comes to mind. The, one of the, but one other thing we do is every month we ask a separate question, and the separate question, an extra question, is you know, a question of the month, if you will, and that separate question is whatever you want to make it. In September we ask, have you or your colleagues ever found an ongoing data loss somewhere else? 55% yes, confirmed, 10% yes, but unconfirmed, that's 65%. Verizon says 80%, we exclude law enforcement from our survey, I'd call that corroborative. <coughs> so this issue of you keep everything, but some of it doesn't matter to you, and so of course, you don't pay as much attention to that, and furthermore, uh, it is impossible to have selective deletion, has its effect on the practice that we are in, and it has its effect on what would be good policy. What would be good policy for this? What would you say about this? I mean, if you're in the consulting trade, you know that as you go to other firms, to go around various firms, one of the things that they, you will find every time is they don't, strictly speaking, know what data they have. It's across the board. They strict, you know, and I'm not making fun of people for that because the volume, the volume is overwhelming. What do you do about that? If you don't know what you have, what do you do? Well, there's two alternatives. One is you take the effort to get rid of things that you don't need. Maybe you do you know, a ls-t or tu and you pipe that through something. Maybe that's what you do. Maybe, maybe it's not because, as you well know, an awful lot of data retention is by fiat, not by choice. On the other hand, maybe what you do is you say, I have to protect everything at the highest level because I don't know where the highest level stuff is, and so everything has to be protected at the highest level. That's diseconomic as a rule. And so what do you do? And the answer is, generally speaking, you fudge. And I'm not making fun of this. It's just a fact of life. It's just what people say. And if you go and give your report about this, if you're a consultant, you go and give your report about this, the first question they will ask is, how are we doing? The second question they will ask is, how do we compare to our peers? Because nobody wants to be the, in, out in front because it probably means you're spending too much money. Nobody wants to be the last gazelle in the herd because the hyenas know that you're the last gazelle in the herd. And so 
this question of how do we compare to others is important. This is where information sharing comes in. Information sharing is an essential aspect to a lot of what we might do. And yet at the same time, if you're in a world in which anonymization is <coughs> practically speaking impossible, practically speaking impossible, what do you do about that? Do you, it is entirely common now for people to turn in data to the federal government saying, I see the following, and have the data that was acquired by a private firm acting in its own account given to the government and then classified. This I view again as a problem. Nevertheless, if you are a consultant, what, that second question they ask you, how do you compare to your peers, what is that? And the answer is, the customer is using you as an anonymization engine. That's what they're doing, they're using you. They're assuming that your trustworthiness is such that you would not share something with them that would violate another customer's rules, but at the same time, you're able to see things that they can't see. I would suggest for those of you who are consultants, that in my view at least, it is a professional duty to do exactly that. And so you now see a lot of that. Mandiant's uh, reports, uh, Symantec's reports, uh, um, everybody has got a report now, uh, Vericode's reports, for example. Everybody's got a report on this. Symantec recently had a paper out, um, probably a year ago now, um, Lila Bilge, and I can't remember the first name of the second author, but the last name was Dumitris. And what they looked at was the way in which um, attacks occur. And what they, look, what they were able to say from their data, and this is a creative reuse of the data they had, <coughs> was that the average zero day is in use 300 days prior to discovery. 300 days. What does that tell you? I'm not sure what it tells you, but I can tell you what our friends at, in defense ask. They want to know who, it, who is behind it. And if they can't get that, they want to say, this attack, was it the same people who did this other attack? They want to know, does it come from the same people? And if they can't get that, they want to know, does it come from a kit? And can the kit be bought? And one of the questions that you might ask is, if I can buy a kit, is that the latest model of Hyundai, or is that last year's model? Is this year's model being used by people who don't share, and they only sell it after they've got a better one, or the one that they've got has been used a bit too much, and they want a fresher one that won't be recognized? These are important questions at the highest level. And what do you do about them? Let me turn to the identity as privacy question. This is not quite a tall enough building. Go, go to the Hancock Tower and look down. Look at everybody's roof. Suppose you see a couple, what's a nice term of art, in flagranto delicto, on a roof. Um, and you have no idea who they are. The question is, do they have privacy? If your answer is, the definition of privacy is unobservability. The answer is no, because you can take a picture of it from the roof, from the observation deck at the Hancock. If, on the other hand, your definition of privacy is the absence of identifiability, then the answer is yes, they have privacy. You can see it, but you don't know who they are. I don't need to tell you that observability is ramping up fast. I spoke of that early on about re-identifiability of photographs, but observability is ramping up fast. If you have bought a new car, for example, you have in each of the tires something that says whether I'm low on air. How does that get to the dashboard since, after all, the tire is spinning and that's a problem? And the answer, of course, is a little Bluetooth radio. That means, and of course, how does it, the, the dashboard say it's your right rear tire? And the answer is each of those little Bluetooth radios are unique. So if you go to London, where they already have the entire infrastructure for cameras at every intersection in every direction, what would it cost to add Bluetooth recognition for cars? The answer is nothing, because they've paid for everything already, and a radio, a radio antenna is cheap. So do you care about that? It's observability. I work in a, an area where, from time to time, I see things early. I can tell you that facial recognition at 500 meters is entirely possible. I can tell you that um, iris recognition at 50 meters is entirely possible. I can tell you that your heart is a small microwave transmitter that currently can be read at five meters out, and furthermore, just like your fingerprints, it's unique. I can tell you that you carry in your pocket, those of you who carry a cell phone, probably has a, it's a smartphone that has an accelerometer. The accelerometer will tell me whether it's you or not because every one of us walks in a slightly different fashion. Gait analysis, as it's called, is entirely doable with the accelerometer in your pocket. In fact, the accelerometer in your pocket, if you're careful about it, you can even tell what someone is typing because when they touch the screen, they move it just a little bit. These are all things that are <coughs> either in lab or in development as we speak. 
What do you want to do about that? And the answer is, you can't stop the progress. I don't see how you can stop the progress, because amongst other things, technology is in a positive feedback loop. And positive feedback loops, by and large, cannot be stopped. So let's assume for the moment that observability is rising at a very fast rate. That would say then, can I do identifiability instead? Can I fall back from my definition of privacy as the absence of observability to one that is the absence of identifiability? And this is where things like the National Strategy for Trusted Identities in Cyberspace actually come in. That it, this is where questions of photo re uh, re-identification, even if you don't take photos and you don't have a Facebook account or what have you, someone probably has. I'm standing in front of a camera. Okay, you were all photographed by the person taking a photograph of the meeting early on. I doubt any of you care that it's known that you were here. But nevertheless, <coughs> there you are. Observability is getting out of control and will not come back. Give it up. I don't like that, but give it up. The only way to really not give it up, the only way to get it back, is to adopt the lifestyle of those uh, who choose such things as Amish or Bruderhof or some one of the cloistered communities, where, of course, you don't have privacy, but only from your community members. So can we do the identifiability? That is a problem, but I would suggest the following. What do you have as a definition of security might be, this is mine, the state of security is the absence of unmitigatable surprise. There will always be surprises. The question is, can you mitigate for them? SB 1386, the data breach law, says there will always be loss of credit cards. The question is, what do you then do? And it says, you know, you buy people a couple years worth of credit watch, and uh, uh, you give them new cards, and, you, and if something's been bought, you know, if a ton of jewelry has been bought in Cairo, you give them the money back, and so forth. That says that surprises will happen, but we know how to mitigate them. So one might say that under the data breach laws, we have a state of security, at least by the definition that a state of security is the absence of unmitigatable surprise. By contrast, what would be safe for privacy? And this is where I'm going to be contentious. I view privacy at this point as a state of privacy is where you have retained the effective capacity to misrepresent yourself. Because if you cannot misrepresent yourself, you don't have it. And I don't like that. But again, I'm not in the wishful thinking department. I'm in the as best I can reality department. And that is, if you cannot misrepresent yourself, uh, what have you got? And I think that um, includes, um, what's a good example? Um, those of you who have a fit, I don't know how many of you still do this, but uh, there was a time when cypherpunks, for example, would generally, uh, uh, at meetings, would swap affinity cards at various, at CVS or what have you, so that <coughs> you're randomizing the tracking mechanism. You might pay, if you have a therapist, you might pay your therapist in cash under an assumed name. Um, if you, uh, if the smart grid comes to pass, you might put a motor generator between yourself and it, so it doesn't read what your appliances are doing. Um, if you, uh, if you're really serious, you probably retain a inventory of misconfigured web servers and you proxy through them. This is what I mean by the effective capacity to misrepresent yourself. And yes, it is absolutely something that can be used for good and something that can be used for bad. I am certain at this point that all security technology is dual use. Dual use is a Washington term for it can be used for offense or defense. I am certain of this. Um, we can argue it another time, but I'm certain of it. If that's the case, then we can't say that this technology cannot be used because it might be used by bad people. We are at great risk of that from our friends in Washington. The uh, issue of Bitcoin might be a place to watch this. It might be a place to watch what Washington does. Only this week, Treasury said that the, bit, the people who run the people who run the um, the Hawala, the uh, uh, Hawala. Right, that they, can't, that they can't deal with Mount, uh, Mount Gox, right? I'm sorry, sometimes I forget the names of things. I'm getting older, it's a feature. Um, <laughs> the alternative is worse, by the way. Um, but watch what happens with Bitcoin. Is it a currency or is it not? Is it specie or is it not? What, what is it? And I don't actually think that it deserves regulation, but it's hard to imagine that there are people who 
make their living making regulations who won't find a reason to want to do that. George Bush was somewhat famous for saying that what he wanted was an ownership society. Some people made fun of that, some didn't. I'm not here to argue the point. But I'll ask you, over the next five years, what will you own? One of my daughters is a tax attorney who does estate planning. It's already in her, as a professional in that field, it is already within her pur purview that, for example, you cannot include your iTunes library in your estate because you can't transfer it. It's not, you have a license, you do not have ownership. What about medical records, electronic health records? Who owns them? I was working in the Harvard Teaching Arena, Harvard Teaching Hospital Arena in the 70s. I believe it was 1975. But at that point, the who owns the medical record changed over from being the patient to being the institution. That was to combat insurance fraud. But nevertheless, that was the situation. Who owns it? Do you have a license to it? In a world in which your medical records are wherever someone, quote, has a need to know, do you own them or do you not? Or do you merely have a license? Or for that matter, are you the license granting authority for those medical records? If I am unconscious, I guess I want anybody to be able to read them. If they find me on the street, and there's a wreck card wrapped around a tree, I suppose I want them to be able to read my medical records regardless of my level of permission. On the other hand, what is the accountability for that? Who owns it? Is that something where I own it? Or is it not? Do you own your face? What is the definition of public? In public is now quite a bit broader than it once was. Do you own your face? Do you own your data? If, particularly if your data is somewhere else. For those of you who keep your, all your data at home or, you know, and only do your uh, email in a text, I'm being autobiographic here, only do your email in a text, in a text system and you, and you keep it all on local machines that you back up yourself to hardware that you own, that's one thing. If, no offense to anybody, if everything you own uh, isn't Gmail, do you own it? Try to erase things sometime. Try to erase things. Open up a Facebook identity and play around with it for a while and then try to make it go away. This is very hard. Marcus Ranum, who some of you may know, uh, who is the inventor of the firewall, uh, quite a while ago allowed some people, he was not on Facebook, he allowed some people to create a fake Marcus Ranum and have fun with it. And the answer is when they were done with the experiment, it was almost impossible to get rid of it because he's well known, not quite a public figure, but you're familiar with the idea of a public figure has no right of privacy, which I will remind you, public figures include everybody who makes laws. And so how do you expect them to have, in some sense, a sympathetic view of what should be rules. Ed Appel, who for 25 years was the FBI's special agent in charge of counterespionage, that was at a time when counterespionage meant people leaving the country with a briefcase. Of course, it does not mean that now, but let's ignore that. He said something important about this. He said, your choice is not one big brother or not. Your choice is one big brother or lots of little brothers. Choose carefully. And I think his advice, which was from 1991, by the way, applies uh, now, and it applies today. America's greatness has been not only the question of, if it isn't forbidden, you're well free to do it. It has been, if you want to reinvent yourself, do it. You know, go west, young man, or whatever. If you want to reinvest your, reinvent yourself, you are able to do it. That is why we are where we are. Can you still do that? Do you want a world in which you can do that? When you change your name, what do you want to do? Do you want to change your name? I would suggest if, if as I said earlier, my definition of privacy is one where you have the ability to misrepresent yourself, I would suggest you want not one internet identity, but as many as you can handle, and you want them to be distinct and you want them to be cultivated, or should I say, perhaps, curated? Do you want them to be something that is under your control? And if not, then you have to concern yourself with the fact that the technologic advance changes the equation of possible and impossible in ways that are not readily identifiable, but which have side effects. I'll close with something I heard at a lecture at Harvard some years ago at the Kennedy School. And I'm sorry, I forget the name of the author. I wish I had it. It is improper to not give people credit. But this speaker said, the four verities of government are that most important ideas are uninteresting. Most interesting ideas are unimportant. 
Not every problem has a good solution. All solutions have side effects. And I think that applies to us perhaps more than anywhere else. I think cybersecurity is the most challenging intellectual profession on the planet. I salute you for being in it, but I'm here to deliver the bad news that you are in it for life. Thank you. <laughs>